Box office top ten this week. It's and actually quite good. I'm sorry. That, that's actually not a bad joke. Yes, it's probably done the rounds, and there are a number of different versions of it, but that's that's the one I had. Yeah, no, I, I actually quite like that. Yeah. Number 21, the Persian version. Which I enjoyed. I thought it was good fun. I think it's a kind of a, a well-done culture clash comedy that goes places that you do not expect it to go at all. I mean, in it's sort of... Not a culture club comedy. No, no not a culture We've club comedy. But remember, war is naughty and people are naughty and people who start wars are really naughty. Yes, and deserve bad things. Bad things. Uh, number 10, The Zone of Interest. She's doing terrifically well for a film which is... Number you know, 25 in the States. Yeah, but for a film which is very challenging and, you know, nobody... It's... It's not one of those things like I was just saying about Mother's Instinct. You know, you could go in an afternoon. You're not going to go, oh, I've got an afternoon free. I know, I'll just watch Zone of Interest. You have to book in to see it, and then you mm -hmm. have to book time afterwards too. So it's doing really well. It's an absolutely brilliant film. Number nine, Drive Away Dolls. Not a hit. What a, what a surprise that this absolutely... <laughs> ridiculously stupid indulgence uh, didn't do well. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was rubbish and I was... It was funny, in the screening that I was in, there were a couple of people laughing. I didn't laugh once. I just thought it was... I think it's the the worst Cohen-affiliated movie since uh, Burn After Reading. But, um, no, it's rubbish. Yep. Number eight, number seven in the States is Imaginary. And I still haven't. I still haven't, and I should do, but I hadn't. But, you know, was, I was... No, I, I will. Here's the problem. The next two weeks, there are two things that I have to catch up that they won't... won't they're not screening in time. So the King, uh, Kong Godzilla, they're not... They haven't screened it yet when we're recording this podcast. It won't screen until this evening, so I'll have to do that next week. And then next week, the first Omen, they're not screening until we're actually recording the podcast. So I'll have to do that. So I've already got a backlog. So I imagine Imaginary is going to get lost in the in the shuffle. Number seven, uh, here's six in the States, Late Night with the Devil. I thought this was great. I thought this was a really terrific um, uh, sort of retro horror chiller inspired by Ghost Watch. It's, a couple of people said, well, you know, uh, that's not what American uh, late night TV was like. Yes, it is. I've watched enough of it because when I was doing the Exorcist book, there was loads and loads of late night TV things about the Exorcist in which Blatty or Freakin would be on. I thought it was really well done. It's just creepy enough to be really engaging and it's funny and satirical. Pete Smith oh, good. says, I don't quite get this, but maybe you will okay. as you've seen it. Dear... I'm getting an M, and is there a Sam? No, Simon. Yes, Simon. Yes. Yeah, it's the, the, the guy is, um, uh, you know, a mind reader. Okay. So he does a thing about in front. I'm here, I'm getting an M, any, oh, okay. a P, okay, no, a, a Z, it. yes, you know. Is there someone here who used to be married to a man with hair? That's like right, yes, yeah. <laughs> I've just come back from a 7 p.m. viewing of Late Night with the Devil at the Shepherd's Bush View. And while I normally stay to the end of the credits for most films, this time was partly so I could wait for the lights to come back on. I haven't had such a strong reaction to a horror movie oh, since wow. Hereditary. Wow. Or when the ending of St. Maud made me audibly yell, blimey Charlie, <laughs> albeit in a less than radio friendly manner. Late Night with the Devil develops an ever enveloping layer of creeping dread with shocking spasms that finally explodes headfirst into an absolute melon farmer of a final 15 minutes. <laughs> the cast were uniformly excellent. I had no idea that the great Michael Ironside was the narrator and the production design, visual style and tight script helped close the walls in on this on the claustrophobia of the film being in real time with the frame by frame scene being a standout. While I would love the film to get the box office it deserves, I also feel its particular style makes it one of the rare films that may even be improved by watching it on a television at home yeah. with the lights off and the door closed. That is an interesting thing because it's like if you're watching something about a television programme, is it actually more... Is it more scary? I mean, I remember somebody saying Bl the Blair Witch Project is terrifying enough, but if you watch the Blair Witch Project at home, okay, it's, it's really, really creepy because it does look like you've kind of, you know, you've you've found a videotape, but you really shouldn't be watching. Daisy VB says, Mark and Simon, I was really interested to discover a controversy brewing regarding the use of AI in some still images yeah, yeah, yeah. within Late Night with the Devil. You didn't mention it on your episode, no. and I'm curious to hear your thoughts regarding the use of AI, no matter how small and in consequential plot wise making its way into a theatrically released picture do you think it should put people off seeing the film that it has completely stamped they used another word on the value of art as some are saying or do you think the film's many other merits warrant a viewing regardless i'm still pondering what i am going to do luckily cinema tickets around my area cost such hideous amounts of money that i'm taking my time to make a decision well i'll be honest with you 
as far as I understand, the AI was just used to generate those the interstitials, um, which are which are very fleeting. Which are, what, just, just because they they'll go away to a break, as as I understand it, they'll go away to an advert break, and they'll come back, and there'll be an image saying, you know, the, the late night TV, you know, uh, uh, night owls. It, it is, and as far as I understand, that's what they've used it for. I'm not entirely sure. The thing is, this is if you're making low budget movies, people are going to use whatever tools they have to hand. It's just you know, this is a little bit like. Uh, um, you know, synthesizers, when synthesizers were first around, people said because it's the easiest way of making a sound. I mean, it it, it didn't put me off the film. I, I wasn't aware of the, the, the controversy about it until after I'd seen the film. And then I read some people say, I'm not seeing it because of the use of AI. Um, I think you're going to be on a sticky wicket if you start... Forevermore. I mean, it is like, you know, being against Wednesday. It's coming round no matter what you do. Uh, Bob Marley, One Love is at number six. It was the headline from the BBFC's rejigging of their classification guidelines recently that it went, that, that was classified as 12A rather than 15 because the the public have decided that they're no longer concerned about uh, marijuana smoking on screen. And that was probably the biggest shift. And what that tells you is that this huge consultation that the BBFC did, the general response from the public was, yes, you are doing what we think is right. Number five, number 19 in America is Migration. Which, you know, again, done very, very well. I say this every single week. Well done to the parent who was, um, you know, uh, smart enough that when their child got scared, they took them out. I, w I would love to know if you were the person who sent in that email, did you go back? Did you go back and see the rest of them? I, did, I think it wasn't a plot spoiler to say they're all fine. Wicked Little Letters is at number four. Loved it. I mean, it's... I. I know that we've been making a joke about the reason it's funny is because hearing Olivia Coleman swearing is funny. There is much more to Wicked Little Letters than just that. And I think the, the, the writing is really well done because the Baroque nature of the swearing, because it is based on a real life case, um, the Baroque nature of the swearing is just very, very strange and, and very entertaining. Tim Evans in Colchester, right? Oh, this is Immaculate, by the way. So oh, okay, three, fine, fine. Yeah. And number four in the States. Yeah. Uh, Tim Evans, having watched Immaculate last night, I decided the following review summed it up nicely. Rosary's baby. Kind of regards. Oh, that's Tim. very good. That's very good. Ben I Vost wish I'd done that. says, Dear correspondent and correspondents, I listened to Mark saying that the last scene of Sydney Sweeney Stara Immaculate. Yeah, Sydney Sweeney Stara Immaculate. Was amazing and so decided to change my cinema going choice from... Uh, Tachikawa's jazz-based animation Blue Giant okay. to said film. Yep. That final scene wasn't bad. <laughs> it wasn't bad. But not better than the final scene of 2022's Pearl, surely. Hello, Tim. Hello, Simon. Surely some mistake. Thank you, Ben. Incoherent. There. Well, the 2022's Pearl has got the most brilliant... Um, it's it's just this holding on Mia Goth's face. And I said it's like the final scene of The Long Good Friday when you just look at Bob Hoskins in the cat in the car that he's you know and he, and he realizes what's happened you can kind of see the whole movie playing out and his his Mia Goth just grinning at the camera in that mad Mia Goth way for three minutes is brilliant but I I genuinely think that Immaculate is, is so much better than I thought it was going to be and I really enjoyed it I do think the final scene is dark 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 number two in the UK and number two in the states is Dune Part Two all the twos at number two it's my question yes how do they get the car bit on the worm. Like when when she's in the sort of like first class version, you know, when of when they're riding the worm, but she's in the bit that's like a kind of like a tent thing. What do they do? They stop the worm? Because that is it premium worm. It is Have premium they... worm, yeah. She's booked it on train line. Yes. And, the, and she's upgraded to first class. But how do they get that thing on the worm? Because as far as we can tell, the worm is m moving very fast. Yeah. You can't get one on Thameslink, by the way. I used to get the Thameslink from King's Cross to Dorking, and now the worm won't go there. It's been, it says you've got to go via Waterloo. Just, I'm not getting a worm been, from Waterloo. It has been bothering me since somebody brought it up. How did they get the first class compartment on top of the worm? Ghostbusters Frozen Empire is a new Ugh. entry and it's a num I, number one I predicted here. it, as I was always said. Yeah, that's what I said. said it's First ab absolute rubbish, but it'll go to number one. Ross says, uh, I went to see the new Ghostbusters uh, over the so. weekend against my better judgment as one of my friends has been feeling rather poorly of late and he mistakenly thought this would lift his spirits. Need needless <laughs> to say, it didn't. it didn't. But not in an offensive way, like some people took Ghostbusters 2016. This movie deserves nothing more than to be forgotten and not spoken of again and exactly. relegated to that same dustbin of history that the 2014 RoboCop remake and, psych and American Psycho 2 
call home. Down with pointless sequels, up with the usual stuff. Hello to Jason. Owen in a haunted library somewhere in Plymouth. As Ghostbusters <laughs> 2 was the first cinema experience I remember, there is always something special and personal when it comes to watching a Ghostbuster movie on the big screen. Although I thoroughly enjoyed Ghostbusters 2016, Ghostbusters Afterlife was the squeal I had been waiting for since my childhood. I imagine that is supposed to be squeal and yeah. not sequel, but anyway. Oh, oh. But, oh, no, oh, yeah, maybe. Well, anyway, maybe. Both, maybe both work. Its high levels of nostalgia also work well for the Columbo story, uh, style story he was telling and bring in the, uh, bringing in the original cast felt like a natural payoff to the plot. I therefore went into Frozen Empire with high anticipation for another fun ride uh, in Ecto-1, and that's exactly what I got. It was a proton pack of cool ideas and a ghost trap full of nostalgia. It packed a lot into its relatively short runtime. Its slow-burning story was like the... Previous instalments, both over the top and world ending, yet remaining grounded in its semi world setting, whatever a semi world setting is. My only gripe would be that uh, where several clips in the trailer did not appear in the movie, which is something that happens quite happens a lot. lot. I can appreciate why those who are not big fans of the original movies or those with immature views on Ghostbusters 2016 might find this entry dull, boring, and derivative, but frankly, I don't care because busting makes me feel good. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, you know. It's rubbish.